Welcome to Finding Hope, The End to Suffering. Hosted by psychologist, author, and co-founder of the Colorado Institute for Conflict Resolution and Creative Leadership, Dr. Barry Weinhold, with national radio host, award-winning producer, and inspirational speaker, Patricia Raskin. Raskin, and welcome Dr. Barry Weinhold, the creator of this wonderful series called Finding Hope, The End to Suffering. Thank Hi, you. Barry. And this is a really good guest we have this month, and I'm just so excited about all the things that she is uh, 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 sharing with us about her story. And now we're going to hear the, the best part, which is she has been become a champion for prison reform. But I'm going to read her bio again for those people just tuning in. And um, we've heard a lot. And now we're going to talk. We're going to kind of close out the series talking about everything that Dr. Getty's been through and how she's really helping with prison reform, as Barry said. So Dr. Karen Gedney is an MD. She's an internal medicine specialist who, in 1987, was the first woman doctor placed in a male medium security prison in Nevada. Against all odds, she stayed three decades and turned this into her calling. She is recognized in both medical and correctional fields. She won the Heroes for Humanity Award in Nevada and was noted as one of the best in the business by the American Correctional Association. When Dr. Gedney retired from the prison, she became an activist in prison reform movement and wrote her memoir, 30 Years Behind Bars, Trials of a Prison Doctor. Today, she advocates for prison reform and inspires individuals and groups to become involved in in reforming the prison system. Welcome back, Dr. Karen Gedney. Well, thank you, Patricia. All right. Barry, this is exciting. Said it, Barry, let's talk about this, how prison reform. Well, I want to say something first about what she said in the last segment that I didn't really address at the end, and that's about forgiveness. And, and how important that is sometimes in finding hope is we carry around a lot of anger and resentment about what happened to us and we act like a victim and we're never going to find hope. And, and so, Karen, you just that story you told about encountering the, the uh, person who was your perpetrator's mother, his, her, yes. his mother, and, and seeing that you still had anger and some forgiveness to do, and then you did something about it. That is really important in terms of helping people uh, finally realize that they're not going to get very far, just keep sticking with the old anger and resentment and and victim stuff and trying to move on. And everyone has that. It's not that it's bad. It's just there's a time for it, and then there's a time to let go of it. And, And you found that time. Yes, and, you know, you are talking about uh, prison reform. I think the greatest piece uh, in terms of forgiveness is the death penalty. Absolutely. Right. And that's one of those things in Nevada, actually, this year, the legislators, uh, there was AB 395, and I really tried to push some of my weight behind it to get Nevada to become a state that would abolish the death penalty. Colorado has done that. Right. Well, they're more forward thinking. Nevada, unfortunately, is still known as the Mississippi of the West. Oh, got a mm. reputation. Yeah, mm. it's not a good reputation at all. And in fact, Nevada also was the first state in this country to uh, use the gas chamber, even though they didn't quite know what they were doing in 1924, (laughs) you know, Mm. and in 1989, I was two years on the job and they asked me to write for the drugs for the execution. Oh yeah. Mm. And I refused and they were not happy with that at all. Mm. And then they had to go outside the prison and pay a doctor who would do anything for money to write the three drugs. And at that time it was sodium pentothal, curare, and a potassium chloride, you know, to kill. Um, And one of the things I really understand about the death penalty was there are people who can do heinous acts, 
uh, terrible acts. And, um, and I, I took care of these people, people that were serial killers. Um, I can talk about one because he's been dead a long time. And if you look at like the 50 worst serial killers in the United States, you'll see Galegos as one. And if you then look at his history, you realize, wow, his father was killed in the electric chair in California the day he was born. Oh, my God. Yeah. All right. I mean, it's just like a wild story. Mm. You also realize that as a child, um, nobody wanted him. And uh, when I see some very, very damaged people in the prison, it's because at a very, very early age, not only are they not cared for, but they develop the identity, I'm a monster. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And then you have this whole sort of thing where the brain follows what it believes it's its identity. And, the, and they also, since they've never felt connection at all, and then on top of it, they have a brain that maybe lacks, let's say, juice or a feeling norepinephrine or adrenaline, feeling alive, they do these horrendous things just to feel something. Right. And, and those people are very dangerous to society. Right. And, they're, and also on the rare end, you know, rare. But still, um, to execute them uh, doesn't bring these unfortunate families peace. No. No. You know, in one, their mind, they're so attached to revenge and retribution. And many families, when they go through the, the court cases and the death penalty and how involved it is and the appeals and this and that, they get like wrung out even worse. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a brutal system and it is, it, there's not much humanity in it. No, and no other really, no other Western industrialized country has the death penalty. I mean, the United States is, yeah, it's an outlier. Yeah, so and incarceration and the death penalty. Right. So, Karen, what are you doing now? I mean, what what movement have you have you seen toward a more humane system? And and also, what other people that you would suggest uh, suggest doing to help uh, forward? ideas on prison reform. I mean, yeah. Can you tell our audience about that, that they could maybe contribute to? Yeah. Um, so first of all, I look at prison reform with three pillars. One is preventing people from ending up in the system. So number one, one of the things when I give my talks, I, I give a, let's say, a concrete example. And the example for me and my husband was we mentored kids who had a family member in prison forever. And uh, we met, we mentored a total of five of these children through the Big Brother, Big Sister organization. And three are college graduates and two are works in progress because they're still in high school. Uh, and that adverse childhood experiences, if you have a parent in prison, you're at much higher risk than if you don't have a parent in prison. But also these children come many times from families where you have a legacy of nothing but criminal activity. Mm -hmm. And I remember, um, well, one of the children um, who was, I got her, she's seven years old, a little black and white girl mix. And, you know, here's my husband, we're a white black couple. And, uh, when she had a little boyfriend in fourth grade and was telling me about him and I, and she goes, Karen, mind you, she's in fourth grade. She goes, I don't date black boys. I'm like, well, why not? She goes, I don't trust them at all. And I'm like, well, you trust my husband. She goes, yes, Karen, but he's one in a million. <laughs> so she's already brainwashed yeah, because she brain. was living in her family where unfortunately, literally every black male in her family she saw was a criminal or had gone to jails mm -hmm. or prisons or abuse. Right. Just a legacy of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but so 
The second piece is when they are in the prison, the prison should be oriented to heal what is broken so that they leave less of a risk than when they enter. Right. Anything else is just stupidity the way I look at it. And then there are different programs. Uh, one of the programs people like to hear about because they love dogs. It's interesting. People have far more attraction to helping a dog than a poor inmate. But there's something called the Puppies on Parole program where you have a win-win-win across the board where people in the outside world love dogs. But in Nevada, they have these pit bull mixes that are considered absolutely unadoptable but they don't want to kill them. And then what do you do with them? So yeah. they ended, oh, look at the puppies on parole. And that's from my website. Uh, all the dogs that were <laughs> uh, well adopted. So in essence, the uh, outside world would front some of the money, the SPCA, and they would train the inmates to take care of the dogs, like 24 hours a day, seven days a week and train them. And the dogs, you take a violent, aggressive dog and you do consistent, consistent love and attention and the right awards. These dogs, unless they were severely brain damaged because they got beat around in the head too much, they turn into loving dogs. Mm -hmm. But it also really transformed the inmate because now they many it was the first time they felt unconditional love in their life plus tactile yeah that ability to touch mm. and to hug mm. another living creature the ability to look into the dog's eyes and see the the eyes cared all of that transformed these guys and as a doctor i saw violence on the prison yard go down wow mm. But that's, like, that's just one aspect of healing. The big one as well is when the inmate leaves, the third pillar is really supporting them when they re-enter society. Yeah. Right. I sit on the board for a, a great organization called the Ridge House, which is in Reno. And that's the only place in really in Northern Nevada that gives helps with residential housing for someone coming out of prison, gives them medical and psych support services. And it's really geared for individuals who have a history of substance abuse because they're at the highest risk for slipping back in. Mm. And, uh, and they help them with jobs. So it's sort of like helping them really re-enter society. So that's my way I look at transformation prevention, healing on the inside, re helping them with re-entry. And I feel my best little niche at the moment is being the storyteller. And I do that through my book, which gives them the inside look. Mm -hmm. But I give that I also speak at, you know, these service organizations sure. where people have never seen the prison presented the way I present it because I'm presenting it as oriented for diagnosis and healing and support. Mm -hmm. yeah, Barry, things like that. Barry, talk about sort of your perspective on all this from where you are as a psych psychotherapist. Well, I think, Karen, yeah, Karen's three pillars are really right on. And uh, I obviously have I've spent more time, I haven't worked at that in prisons that much. so. I, uh, I, I'm spending more of my time on prevention to try to uh, uh, get people uh, and the law enforcement community more attuned to restorative justice rather than the reputative and revenge-oriented justice system that mm -hmm. exists now in most places. And, and uh, that's where I spend most of my energy, but I think it's, it's certainly a, a place i have always in my whole career have been focusing on prevention. And I sometimes feel like a voice in the wilderness because most of our resources don't go to prevention. They go to trying to fix something after it got broken, which is mm -hmm. a very inefficient way to try to handle or deal with a, or correct a problem. So, mm -hmm. and then uh, what the healing inside the prison, uh, I mean, that is 
vital because I mean you have a so-called captive audience and you have people there that if you really reach out to them and help them see how they can change a lot of their thoughts and their beliefs and their behaviors uh, they they come out of prison they can come out of prison a different person entirely different person mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and then what you said about the about after the aftercare thing i mean we still have a long way to go there that when we release people from prison uh, back mm -hmm. into society there has to be a, a very careful transition for them to do that because mm -hmm. it's, it's after they've been behind bars for some number of years, coming out into the so-called real world, the outside world, is traumatic. And they need support systems. They need maybe groups of, of, of other inmates who've done it successfully. They need all kinds of ways to help them uh, transition, get them jobs, get them housing, get them. Get yeah. them uh, and, and this is this is it's a big task, but I think it comes because we have compassion instead of anger and revenge. And that's the biggest challenge is how do you get the general public out of having to just worry about locking them up and, and getting revenge about things. And that's a mind switch that I'm, I work on all the time with the people I work with. Right. And so well said, Barry. And Karen, what would you, were coming to the close of our series, yes. what would you to leave our listeners with in terms of finding hope, the end to suffering when it comes to the prison system? I would encourage them to think of what I consider the three C's, which means be curious, be compassionate, and collaborate to change the system. That's really what I want to get across. Mm -hmm. And um, and I know for myself, I mean, I've had some people read my book, and this is just recently, one of the uh, sort of attorney generals in my state, a female who retired recently and read my book and contacted me and said, you know, I just want you to know that I always hated inmates, and this book has changed the whole way I thought about it. Um, and that was 30 years as an AG, I mean, you know, an attorney general. So uh, that, that was that was powerful and i think it's the power of the stories sure absolutely yes and thank you so much barry your closing thoughts here well thank you again karen for your story and your insights on how to change this i think very primitive uh, uh prison system that it just needs to it, it's begging for reform and and it takes people who, have, like you, who have compassion for inmates, and, and you have that because you saw it inside. And, and very people, very few people have that ability. So your stories help bring them into that prison and help them develop that compassion. So keep telling your stories. And also, it, there's the time right now because you know over 30 years ago prison reform wasn't talked about at all. It was just on like some exponential growth curve. And then I think like, you know, the United States is a, a place where things go so far out of whack that then they finally pay attention and then people start talking about it. This is why now you hear actually bipartisan right. uh, agreement, like, hey, this doesn't work. <laughs> Right. Okay, it only yeah. took you like more than thirty years. I, I was at the front end when I was saying this. Oh, we had, we you had were a pioneer. Part. You were a pioneer, really. Yeah, and we we're getting uh, bipartisan support in the legislature for reforming the system. Which is great. We want to thank you, Dr. Karen Gedney, for your incredibly inspiring story, the work that you're doing on prison reform having been through a really difficult and really horrific experience many years ago, you know, being assaulted and raped um, by an inmate and getting through that with compassion and love eventually, and now being able to really help with prison reform. And we know that your movie has a possibility, your book has a possibility even of becoming a movie. There's yeah, a possibility yeah, that. Yeah, and so, um, sort of we'll, interesting. <laughs> right, and we'll put your website up on the screen now too, so that people can certainly um, find you, 
and and write to you. They can write to you from the yes, website. Yes, they can. There is there's a form for that as well. Right. All right. Well, let me thank take you. a take a take a minute, Patricia, and talk about next month's guest. Uh, All right. And thank who, you, Dr. Gedney. And thank who, you. Who actually contacted me with her story, and I found her story so compelling that I said, "Yes, you have to be on our show." So, uh, Tiffany is uh, a Christian. She's been a Christian all her life, and she was part of a Christian church in the South that became a cult. And she describes the, the problems she had in being in that Christian cult and how she extricated herself from it and, mm -hmm. and is able to now help others uh, who find that, they, that their, their experience is much less positive than they'd hoped in their church. So uh, we'll be anxious to hear her story. Yeah, thank you. Barry, it's an honor and pleasure to work with you uh, each week on this incredible podcast, which is Finding Hope, The End to Suffering. And we want, want to thank Ben, Ben Barber, who was with us every week and um, helps us with all of the technical. If it wasn't for Ben, we, we wouldn't have a program. We'd just be talking and nobody would see or hear us. <laughs> And, and so. Bailey, who's our uh, social media marketer, is busy trying to get the word out to everybody and, and right. expand our audience. And so, right. and again, we want to thank Dr. Karen Gedney for a very compelling interview. And her book is 30 Years Behind Bars Trials of a Prison Doctor. Right. Thanks, Barry. See you I next know. time. Mm -hmm. See you next time. Bye for now. I'm Patricia Bye -bye. Raskin. Barry, okay. Dr. Barry Wenhoff. This episode was brought to you by the Colorado Institute for Conflict Resolution and Creative Leadership. Find out more about these resources at wineholds.org. Dr. Weinhold is the author or co-author of 75 books on psychology, including his latest book, Get Real, The Hazards of Living Out of Your False Self, available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and more. Patricia Raskin is the host of the nationally recognized program, The Patricia Raskin Positive Living Show, and is currently heard on voiceamerica.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and more. New episodes of Finding Hope, The End to Suffering can be found every Wednesday. If you like the show, please leave a review and give us a rating. 